that be able to bring your your very words into our presence and learn from those words um, you are a God who speaks you are a God who wants us to know you uh, you're not hiding uh, our, which just a, dependent on how, how much we want to know you as Proverbs says if we seek you as silver and gold as something that is truly valuable you will reveal yourself because you want to reveal yourself to us but you want to know that you are valuable to us and Lord you are the most precious the most valuable thing we could pursue and we thank you that that's what we do that's what we get to do we live in a country we live in a place where that can freely happen and I just thank you so much for your grace and mercy and giving us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand and that we have the power to change. Um, and Lord, may that change result in glory and honor and praise to you who are God most high. Thank you for our time in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. I have, uh, as I said, I started out last week and uh, the title of this was So Great a Salvation. And that is specifically because that's really what Peter is trying to remind them of. You know, we know that the book of uh, 1 Peter and 2 Peter is written to a, a group of people that are suffering, which is very interesting because James and Hebrews are both uh, books that are speaking to suffering Christians. Because, you know, back, as I've said many times, back in that day to become a Christian meant suffering. They went hand in hand. They weren't, they weren't Americans like we are where we think that we live in a nation that, it, that God is blessing our nation and that we're, we're a Christian nation, so therefore he's going to make everything good with, with no conflict and our lives are going to be peaceful and everything's going to be good. I'm not sure whoever played that out and actually lived that, but it's not what scripture says, as we can see. It's not really uh, what we should be aspiring to, uh, which sounds like a very weird concept when we think suffering is what we aspire to. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Suffering is what we aspire to. I don't know any of us here who really like that very well, as we talked about in the group today, that it's not something we like. And yet that is exactly what Peter is trying to convince these people of. You don't like it, but it is the thing, the very thing God has designed for you. And as we were talking, I realized that, and I mentioned that in our group today, was that we don't understand that this is our time. Because we're, in, we're now moving in our nation in a place where comfort is no longer the top thing. So this is our time, guys. This is when we can shine. This is really when we can step up and be who God wants us to be. And, and that's because the suffering is coming. We haven't felt it really drastically yet. But I don't want to wait till I get in the midst of the drastic and then decide that I, whether or not I'm going to stay there or not. I want to make sure I know ahead of time that I'm preparing for that. It's kind of like getting into the middle of labor and then going, I don't think I really want to do this. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, I, I'm sure all of you here that are mothers did that. Uh, only my, then you realize there was a time when I was pregnant that I was like, okay, I've, this baby has to come out. Yeah. Oh, I didn't really think about that too much. And then when I was in labor, it's like, I am never doing this again. Never. Why did somebody, Susan, why did you not tell me? What the heck is this all about? And I have three kids. So it's it's like you don't learn. You do it again. No, I don't learn very well. None of us did. Uh, because the prize was worth it, right? That's exactly what Peter is trying to tell us. The goal of the suffering is so worth it. So worth anything we have to pay to do it. Um, and that's exactly what he's trying to say because our salvation is great. I started out with that reminder in Hebrews 2, um, for if the word spoken th uh, through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? And really that means how shall we escape if we show no care for or carelessly disregard so vast, so precious a salvation? That's really what is being said in that Hebrew verse that there at the top of your notes. Our salvation is precious. And what's interesting with Peter is he starts out, you know, that's what I think I've noticed about this, is when we talk about the, this, the um, actually the, the hideousness of the suffering these people were going through, we can't even, we can't even in our, our brain, wrap our brain around what it must have been like to live under those kinds of conditions and to pay that kind of a price for being a, a believer. 
So when we think suffering, we think like right now, well, man, look at the cost of eggs. Jeez. Uh, you know, I mean, what's going on? I mean, really, there's, I went to the store and I couldn't get my favorite cookie because they're not like, they're like not delivering them or something. It's like, wow, this is beyond what we should have to put up with. <laughs> we clearly do not understand suffering, but Peter did. Peter understood suffering. Peter was crucified upside down, so he eventually was going to suffer even more so. But uh, he did understand what that was, and he was trying to relate to these people um, what that suffering meant to them. And what I, what I think is very interesting about his, the way he approaches this, especially at the beginning of the letter, is that he doesn't start out with, gee, guys, I know you're really suffering. This is really bad. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm sure you can just get just... Get, dig down deep and you can make it through. That's not what he started with at all. He started with our great salvation. That's what he started with. Let me tell you, let me remind you in the midst of your suffering how great your salvation is. And so it's like, it's like now when I look at Brandy and I think, look how great a thing I got when I was screaming with agony. Uh, it was worth every single pain. Everything, because it's it's a great thing that we receive. That's what he's trying to tell them. Your salvation is great. It's worth it. It's it's too precious to to let go now just because the suffering of this world. That's what he's telling them. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to uh, first read to you before I go on. Uh, well, quickly, I'm gonna. I as I said, I think we went to by His blood. So I started out with the great salvation is initiated by God. And that's what Peter begins to tell them. This, this is a God-initiated salvation. And it was for your, uh, for your blessing. You were chosen by the foreknowledge of God, for those of you who don't have the blanks filled in, sanctified by the Spirit to obedience to Jesus. And that means you are made holy by the Spirit uh, in A. And then B, it was by his blood. So the suffering was there in the blood. And that great salvation... It is great because it incorporates a living hope. And this is what you guys looked at a lot in your, in your lesson today. It incorporates a living hope and an imperishable inheritance. Those are the things we live for. We live for the living hope and the imperishable inheritance like I have right here. From what I went through in the suffering, what you have with your children. There was an outcome and it was worth it. We have to make it through and believe that until we get what was promised. And that's what Peter's trying to teach. He's starting out reminding them of that before he ever even discusses the suffering. Remember what you live for. And I, I just very quickly, I, I wrote this, this is a journal that I write in, and I wrote this, and it was kind of as I was thinking about Peter. So I want to read to you what I wrote about really the, what I see as, the, as what Peter's trying to say. And what really I want us all to understand and grasp. So I wrote, Peter is not saying just do good stuff instead of doing bad stuff. That's, that's really important to understand. Because when he goes on later to start to list some of the bad behaviors and some of the good, it's, it's like, whoa, I'm overwhelmed with, the, with who I am, really. Um, and so I need to shape up my act as many times as we think. I need to try harder to do good stuff. That's not what Peter's saying. And again, th these people are suffering. So doing good stuff at this point is really not going to uh, solve their issue. So he's not saying just do good stuff instead of doing bad stuff. Peter is saying, be who you were born again to be. Be who you were born again to be. If you are a believer in Christ, that's what he's saying to us. Be who we were born again to be by imperishable seed, by the precious blood of Christ. Be who we were born to be. Walk in the light you now possess. Walk in the light you now possess. Claim the heritage you have become a, a child a, to live out the truth that has claimed you. Live out the truth that has claimed you. Notice none of this talks about suffering. He's assuming the suffering is going to happen, but this has to be the foundation of what our faith is. First, set your hope on your new home. Set your hope on your new home, not on this world. Set it on your new home. 
Don't let suffering or distraction cause you to drift back to your old familiar life, but stand firm in your new life of righteousness and walk proudly in it. Now, people who are suffering for the name Christian, that's really what he's telling them. You have been given a gift. Don't diminish that gift by denying it. You have been given the most precious thing that could be given in life. Do not deny it, but live in light of it. Be proud of it. Walk proudly in it. Let the grace that is now yours catapult you onto holiness within every circumstance. So don't, don't hide it. Don't, don't pretend like you're not a believer. Don't make, it, don't make it like do the least you possibly can. No, let it catapult you. Let that grace catapult you into the fullness of this new life that has been given and the reminder of the hope that is to come and the inheritance we're going to receive. Let it catapult you onto holiness within every circumstance. And this is one that we'll talk about today. Take control of your mind and fill it with truth. That's what we're doing here today. Take, take control of your mind and fill it with truth. Don't fill it with continual complaining about your suffering and overwhelming yourself with the realities. It doesn't mean you're not to this. He's not saying you're, we, I know you're suffering. But to just dwell on that is not going to help. You have to fill your mind with the truth. And the truth is you have a great salvation and it's worth suffering for. The outcome of your salvation will be worth it in the long run. That is really what Peter's trying to tell them. He's not saying, he's not trying to diminish their suffering. He is just trying to accent the reality of why that suffering is happen, happening and, and the hope that, it, that we have that we live for in the midst of it. So um, it, it incorporates a living hope and an imperishable inheritance, and it is activated by mercy and accomplished by res the resurrection of Christ. This is the things he's reminding them of why your, your salvation is so great. What I, I was learning something um, the other day. I'm, I'm always, I, there's always something new coming in. But one thing that struck me is the difference between grace and mercy. And, and I liked it here because mercy means to have compassion on or have active pity. And I have learned to pray differently because of those two words. Um, the word mercy is a reference to my physical um, brokenness to my physical inadequacy, to my inability as a fallen human being to do what is righteous. I, that's what mercy refers to. I can't do it. I fail all the time. I struggle with the reality of my flesh, and that's exactly what Peter's referring to here. Ask God for mercy. When our flesh is weak, ask God for mercy. When we need to live up to our salvation because our flesh is weak, now we need grace. Do you see the difference? Mercy has to do with our brokenness in this physical world. Grace has to do with the empowerment we've been given in our spirit to live despite the brokenness of our, of our human nature. I love that. So there are times when I just beg God for mercy because, man, I'm just broken. I just, I just can't. I'm just a wreck. And then there's other times is, is that I pray for grace because I want to live up to what I've been saved for. There's, that's, a, that's a different thing. And, th and when I pray for other people, that, those two words come in as, as well. Sometimes when I pray for an unbeliever, it's like, okay, they're just so broken, Lord. They just need mercy. And then there's other times when it's like it's for a believer. They need grace to recognize who they are. So that's a, a those are two significant words. But it says it is activated by mercy. God had pity on us because we're broken. <laughs> We are, we are physically, humanly broken. And it is by his, mercy, and by his mercy that he did those things for us. The grace comes in with the salvation that was given. Uh, number two, it results in inheritance that can't be diminished. That's our hope. Um, and I do think we, we are super distracted, uh, and we'll go on with that uh, a little bit, um, by this world. We forget that we're living for something other than this. I don't know about any of you, but do you ever, do you ever forget that? Do you ever kind of get lost in all that's going on here and forget that there's a heavenly purpose why I'm walking in this right now? And really, I'm living here for that reality. I'm not, I'm not obtaining that reality to help me live here. That's, that's really a, 
That's really sometimes I forget that. I get super distracted from that. And, and we need to remember that. That inheritance is what we're looking for. Christ is worth it. Our eternal hope is worth it. It's going to be far beyond our wildest dreams. I really believe that, that the reason that we don't get to see more of it is because we'd all want to die. We'd all want to die and go there. I know Susan does now. <laughs> There's times when Jesus is like, I just want to go. I just want to go be there. But you know, she's not done here yet. But So sometimes we're not, we're not allowed to see how wonderful it's going to be, just, just for that reason. All right. Uh, and the third part of it there is our great uh, salvation. Our, in our great, our great salvation, faith is tested as to its value and genuineness by fiery trials. Okay, now we're starting off in, in verse 6, which is where we're supposed to start today. That was all just review, right? Yeah, yeah. 15 minutes. I know. In this you greatly rejoice, even now, now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. That was the... The, where we, uh, part of what we put, the verse that we looked at very closely. So he's telling them, this is your great salvation. And then now he's saying, you greatly rejoice. And now he kind of on a sideline mentions the suffering. You see that? This is your great salvation. This is what you have to live for. This is all your hope. This is the wonderful things that are coming. But I know that right now you're distracted a little bit by this suffering that's going on. So then he brings it in. He brings in the suffering. So, um, but faith is tested as to its value and genuineness by fiery trials. And this is what he's going to go on to say. The suffering, he had to get them a right perspective on the suffering in order to say that your suffering is for you, not against you. Your suffering is, is your gift from me, from God. Not from Peter, but from God. It is not uh, your burden. If, you have, if we have a right perspective of suffering, it is a gift. And that's what I said, this is our time, guys. If we're, if we're going to enter a time in America where we actually start to suffer, and it will be nothing compared to what these people went through, I'm sure, but this is our time. This is the time when God is definitely working in our lives. This is a time when we can really step up and grow and come to know him. So we rejoice in it. That's what he's saying, you're going to rejoice in it. You're going to rejoice in that. Um, so, number one, it is a reason to greatly rejoice no matter the cost. And their cost was very high. Uh, but that's what he's telling them. Because that cost is because it is the most precious commodity. It is the, this life is not the precious commodity. Our future hope and our inheritance in heaven and bringing glory to God because of the inheritance we are going to receive is our most precious commodity. That is lived out by faith in keeping our eyes focused on that. That's the only way we can walk by faith and that is if we begin to look at scripture and wash ourselves with it and be reminded, just like Peter's doing right here, why are we living this life? For that one. That's why we're living it. That's what it's for. So, because it is the most precious commodity, your faith, your trust in Christ, your seeing him as he truly is, your being convinced that he is worth every single cost there is on this earth in order to engage with him, in order to possess him, is worth it. That's what it is the most precious thing. Do we live like that? Do you live like that? Do you live like Christ is and our eternal world is the most precious thing on this planet? And I mentioned last week do, the humbling reality that we're all sitting here, been given this gift when there's many out there dying and going to hell right this minute. Do we understand what we've been given? Do we care? Or all we do is complain because it's not comfortable enough. Well, I believe, and you can put on a side note of, to these three that are there, uh, uh, and the third one is its value is enhanced by the fire of trial because it, its result is praise, glory, and honor in Christ, to Christ. That's the third one. And he said, that's why it's valuable. But it has to be tested. So next to that, this is what I'd like you to write. Next to those three. The extent we are willing to suffer for someone or something reveals how much we value it. The extent we are willing to suffer for someone or something 
reveals how much we value it. That's where we are today, ladies, after studying 1 Peter, even just chapter 1 and chapter 2 on your point. He's bringing us to a, to a place where he's saying, do you value it? How much do you value Christ? You know what? It's a drive out here for some of you, much further than it was where we had it before. Does that seem like suffering to you? To some it does. To, to some we knew they won't come because it's too far out. Yes. The extent we are willing to suffer for someone or something reveals how much we value it. That is proven by right now, those of you who have children out there, if there was a threat right now to one of your children out there, what would you do? You're gonna, you don't care. If, if there was a shooter out there, how many of us would run out there in the line of fire because there's our child's out there? Because we value them that much. That's what, he, that's what Peter's trying to say. Our salvation is so great, it is the most valuable thing we have. And you know what? In the American church today, we play games with it. We treat it like a toy. That once it's broken, I'll just get a new one somehow. We, we don't value it to where we're willing to pay a price for it. And that's what Peter's trying to remind them. And they are paying a high price for it. But he's telling them it is worth it. It is worth it. If we can't pursue God's word because it makes us a little uncomfortable, there's a lot of verses to look up, we may want to rethink what we think suffering really is or what the value of Christ really is to us. That's just the hard truth. That's just the reality of it. And that I, there was a quote, and I've, I've said it to many people, <laughs> And of course, I fall. I'm, I'm no. I'm guilty. I'm talking to me too here, because I like comfort. Trust me. I really like comfort. But it seems like today um, we are thinking that that's what God is obligated to give us, when what we're finding out in Peter is that that's the opposite of what He wants for us. So the the quote I heard was, "How is it that we think that we should appeal to to people's self interest or their comfort?" We should appeal to people's comfort in the church and that in response to that, they will be self-sacrificial. <laughs> Why do we think that? Why do we think that we have to appeal to their comfort? We have to give them the soft seats, the coffee bar, make sure that my kids are taken care of, make sure that they got all the, everything is comfortable, don't ask too much of me. Don't, yeah, wife, whatever it is, cushions on the seats, yeah, whatever it is. Why do we think we have to appeal to their comfort in order to get them to come, when really we're supposed to be teaching them to be self-sacrificial. Does that even make sense? No. That's the state of the church today. That's where we are today. If we are not comfortable, if it doesn't feel good to us, if it asks too much of us, even a little bit, we're not in. So where is that going to put us when the suffering actually comes? Trouble. Trouble. We're in trouble. That's why this is so significant. Because like I said, I don't want to wait till I'm in the midst of the hard suffering to make a decision of whether I think Christ is, is sufficient or not. I want to make sure that my heart is fully filled and fully convinced that he is worth it. So that when or if the suffering comes, I am fully convinced I'm ready to have my head chopped off if that's what's necessary. But right now it's like, well, you know what they... Their seat's not comfortable. I don't think I want to go. <laughs> uh, so we've got some work to do, right? We've got some work to do. So that's how much how we decide what's valuable. Uh, Roman numeral four, our great salvation is so significant, as you saw today in your questions, that prophets and angels are consumed by it. Salvation is such an anomaly to angels because they don't need redemption. And, to, and I, as I said today, I think, I think they're like, why would God go to this extent to redeem these kinds of creatures? I wonder that myself. Why would you go to the extent to offer yourself for me? Doesn't even make sense. And the angels were like, yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> but the prophets were given visions of the salvation that was to come, and it came upon them like the word of God does when, it, when, they, when they write it out. They got this information, and then they went, 
Wow, I want to know something about that information. I just spoke it, and I don't really even understand it, but I want to know what he's referring to. I want to know what this salvation is going to look like. They longed to know. They spoke it and didn't even fully understand their own words. And they longed to know what that salvation was because it was so unique. It was so different. It was such an anomaly to what they would have expected. Judgment is what they expected. And yet there's this hope that's coming, this salvation that's coming, this redeemer that's coming. What in the world is that going to look like? That's, that's, they understood it. Then they understood that it was for us, and they were just there to speak it, and it wasn't going to come right away. So the prophets who wrote of it desired to understand what kind of grace that kind of grace more fully. And it means to crave, to search out, to investigate. They're like, I just wrote this in Isaiah, and I am just desirous to know what I just wrote about. What does all of this mean? You can imagine Isaiah 53. What, you know, wow. This is what the Messiah, what, what in the world is this, is this all about? They, they crave to know that. And they diligently search. It means careful search means to explore diligently. If they did it, shouldn't we do it? If it was precious to them and it wasn't even for them at that time, it's for us and we just act like it doesn't matter. I was just talking to my brother the other day and I asked him that question because he's he was very big on the Ten Commandments. He thinks the Ten Commandments are the whole end all do all of salvation. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, how do I, what do I say here? Um, and I, I, so I finally said, well, uh, how do you think that connects with the rest of the Bible? Well, I'm sure it's all, it all goes together. Well, do you think the Bible has a lot of errors because people wrote it? Well, yeah, I'm sure it does. Yeah. Men probably really screwed that up. Well, what about the Ten Commandments? <laughs> no, those are good. Those, are, those were good. <laughs> so you don't think that God, and we'd already talked about the fact that he created all things and he's all-powerful, mind-boggling. All he could do is sit there and go, I can't even wrap my brain around that. I can't even realize what God... Yeah, that God, you don't think he can protect his word to make the rest of it accurate as well? And then the next day, I got to read to him a passage from Romans about corruption, of, uh, about sexual immorality, and all that's in Romans chapter 1, which is where we live right now. And he's like, wow, I didn't even know the Bible said that. <laughs> there it is. Imagine that. Imagine that God has something besides the Ten Commandments to say. That's a big um, book for the Ten Commandments. That's a big book for the Ten Commandments, exactly. See, but the rest of it's all corrupted. It's like just the Ten Commandments because, you know, Charlton Heston, he knows. <laughs> he got the good stuff. After that, who knows what wrong. That kind of is his era. <laughs> yes. Um, I had some quotes here about the Bible that I did want to share with you. I don't know where I am for time. Uh, the importance of the Bible is that it gives us the opportunity to see and know God. The scriptures reveal his character and nature, his sovereignty and power, and his reason for creating us, the universe, and everything in it. We read about God's dealing with humankind, his goodness and grace, his light and love, his holiness and justice, and his mercy and compassion. Why would we not be in this book all the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it just makes so then I looked at Barna, I was looking, I, and I don't really like statistics real well, but it was interesting to say what Barna had to say about um, people and their response to scripture right now. It says, to the statement, the Bible contains everything you need to know to lead a significant life. This was the question they asked. It says that uh, there is rising skepticism about the Bible as a sufficient guide for living a meaningful life. The percentage of people who strongly agree with the statement, that statement that it has everything you need, has contracted in six years from 53% in 2011 to 45% in 2016. And the percentage of those who disagree strongly or somewhat have increased over the same time frame from 23 to 33%. Was that survey though the pastors? Uh, I, it didn't say who the, it was, it was just a, a if it was the recent one from May, 2022, it was pastors, pastors that, that were that? being surveyed. Well, I just thought one way or the other, we're, we're talking about millions of people here that, and this is a, a statistic re regarding to um, the biggest percentage of people in the United States. And it's, go so the scriptures are being thrown out, guys. They're being thrown out the window. 
they are disregarded and disrespected and they really just feel it's full of lies then it went on it says what the research means even in just a few years barney has been conducting the state of the bible interviews the data is trending toward bible skepticism <clears throat> said David Kinneman, president of Barna and director of the research. With each passing year, the percent of Americans who believe that the Bible is just another book written by men increases. So to, the, so, to, so to do the perceptions that the Bible is actually harmful and that people who live by its principles are religious extremists. That's your persecution, guys, right there. And it's coming harder. Mm -hmm. So we, we decide now. Are we going to stand for this truth? Are we going to consider it precious? Are we going to value it? Are we going to raise it? Are we going to immerse ourselves in it? And then be ready to suffer for it when they go to take it away? Because it's coming. It is coming. And that was from 2016. So you know it's even more so now. All right, so... Um, Number two, uh, angels long to see it clearly. It means to set their mind to know thoroughly. Angels are really fascinated by the idea of, re of redemption because they aren't redeemed. They aren't redeemable. That is uniquely a human gift. Uniquely, God has given salvation to human beings. Number five, it requires a response. And this is really the main portion of what I wanted to look at. I tried to imagine that. And that's, that is in your, uh, it starts in verse 13 with the therefore. Uh, so it requires a response on number five. The therefore means because of all that we've just said, because of how great this salvation is, because of the fact that it's worth suffering for, therefore, this is how you need to respond. That's what he's telling these people. And the first thing he tells them Gird the loins of your mind for action. And that literally means fasten your belt. Fasten your belt. Gird your loins with truth is what Ephesians 6.14 calls it. And that meant when they wore their skirts and they were getting ready to go into battle, they literally had to lift the skirt up to get it out of the way so they could move quickly and accurately and stuff it into their belt. The belt held it there for them when they needed to move for action. And that's what he's saying. Gird your mind. Get your mind ready for action. Don't compromise on the truth. That's the truth. Filling your mind with truth is how we gird our mind. That's what we're doing here today. We're girding our minds for action. Then it says, uh, Isaiah uh, 11, 5, get, or 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, get rid of any hindrance to right thinking. That's what that means. Get rid of any hindrance to right thinking. Okay, let's think for just a second, guys. How many things do you involve yourself in in any given day that probably distort your thinking? Facebook, news. the news, mm -hmm. whatever it is that is going on that gives us a distorted view of what we're here for. That's what he's saying. If, if, it's, if it's going to detract you from the realization of your future hope, if it's going to get you focused right here and all of the craziness that's going on, that's not girding your mind for action. Now, you can actually listen to those things and gird your mind for action while you're doing it, but that takes washing your mind in the word to do that so that then you respond to what you're hearing with the truth instead of just the craziness that goes on in our head. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of craziness out there. A lot. So, um, get rid of any hindrance to right thinking. Keep sober in spirit. In spirit. 1 Peter 4, 7 means sound judgment. And that means to be self-controlled and of a sound mind. Do not, he's telling them, don't let the physical things that you are suffering deceive you into thinking you need to throw out God in order to have comfort. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to compromise. Because you know what? Throwing out God to ease the comfort of this world was only temporary. We're only here for a short time. The, etern the eternal things that we are living for are worth letting go of some things right here in order to grasp that. Be self-controlled in your thinking. Wow, that's tough right now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Because can't you just hear something on the news or hear, see something, and all of a sudden you're just off. Like just, wow, I'm just mad, what about this? And we get, you get all these discussions like this craziness. So it's tough to have a self-controlled mind. Fix your hope completely, and that means entirely with all wavering on the grace of salvation. This is his, fi- this is his point. Fix your hope on the salvation, the great salvation you've been given, not the suffering you're going through. Remember, the suffering is to help you with your great salvation. It's a gift. See it that way. Don't let it detract you from the desire to live out our salvation. Don't be ignorantly conformed to former lusts, but be holy. I was going to read all those verses. Obviously, I can't do that. So, in other words, don't be ignorant. Be, that's the girding up of your mind. We fall for a lot of stuff out there. There is, there is so much information. It's like the Tower of Babel. Blah, 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 blah. blah. And we just, we just, it just goes in our mind and it takes over. And he's like, don't be ignor- ignorantly conformed to the former lust. You're not who you used to be. You've been bought with a price. You're somebody new. Invest in that person. Conduct yourself with fear, reverence, respect, honor for God. And that means you know the cost of your redemption. When you, when you realize what was given, when I think about that, as I told you last week, it is the most humbling thing I can possibly wrap my brain around. That Jesus Christ, the most perfect human being that ever lived, the righteous son of God, hung on that cross and endured that suffering for me, Seriously, when I deserved even worse than that cross, I deserved the eternal fire of hell, and he hung there for me? Why would, I, why would I take that lightly? Why would I not consider that as a privilege? Why would I not value that more than more anything more precious than anything this earth could ever give? And the last one, of course, was the result of this is that we love one another because, you know, Christ died for you. So therefore, I should love what he valued. You are what he valued. And then I am what he valued. So we love each other because we are valuable possessions of the king of the universe. All of us. Every one of us. So what happens to you is important to him. And therefore should be important to me. Because what happens to me is important to him. And should be important to you. That's what love does. It unites us in that way. That's a tough one in this world right now. It's, it's really being tested, actually. And that means not hypocritically. Don't feign love. Love does not mean I have to like somebody, by the way. It just means I have to care about their well-being. That's all it means. I don't have to like them. The, the man who helped, the, the good Samaritan that helped the man on the road, probably didn't like him at all. He didn't even know it. And he probably looked pretty disgusting when this man helped him. But that's not what he was worried about. He was worried about, this is a human being. This is somebody that God values. So therefore, I value them as well. That's what it means to love one another. Not hypocritically, but with a clean heart. And that love is the result of the truth in a purified soul. When we have the truth of all those things we just mentioned, the result of that would be loving one another because God values us enough to love us. So how ridiculous for God to love you and we not love one another. That doesn't make sense. In fact, that's what 1 John is all about. If you say you love your brother, but you, if, if you say you love God, but you don't love your brother, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you because the two go hand in hand. So this is the word of God that was preached to you. Peter is saying this is the very basics of the gospel that Jesus preached And his disciples came and preached to you, of which Peter was one. So he's like, I'm not saying anything new here. This is exactly the word that brought you to to salvation to begin with. And that word has not changed. It is the same word in suffering as when you're not suffering. The truth is still the same. 1 Peter is a dynamic book of what it means to be human. Of what it means to live on a planet that is broken with broken people. And still walk with integrity and love God because of our future hope. Our salvation is great. And that's what we live for. Let's pray.
Father, your truth is dynamic. Your truth is profound. And it grates against us as human beings. But it really is, that grating is just simply to scrub us clean. To scrub us clean of the filth that our old person carries around with it. Lord, we want to be purified. We want to be cleansed. We want to be holy people. And we live in a world that just continually pokes us in the eye and keeps us from seeing what we need to see. But your word is life, and it is light, and it is truth, and it is hope, and it is perfect. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you press it into our hearts, that you teach us, each one of us, right where we need to learn it, and that because of that word being pressed into our heart, we are strengthened and we are renewed and we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind that we might become more like Christ in whom you created us to be like. Thank you for the wonderful privilege we have of studying it. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.